Okay, so um, in terms of interactions then, I'm sort of at the hub of a network of interactions of people who are interested in the origin of early forests. That includes um, most particularly Bill Stein in uh, upstate New York, but also with John Marshall, Peter Giesen in Germany, and Hong He Xu, who's normally in China, but is actually in the room at the moment, which is very nice. And um, on Friday, I, I took this down off my wall and, and scanned it in. Um, it's an image which I recovered from the bottom of a drawer in the paleontology lab, which has probably been there since the 1960s. And I think it's a reconstruction by uh, Sir Denik Burian. Um, it predates the work he did on uh, the book, The Life Before Man. And uh, it's a reconstruction of Devonian landscape, which includes uh, elements of work by people particularly from the 1920s. On the <coughs> left here, we have uh, Winifred's Gold Winifred Goldring's reconstruction of Eos spermatopteris from uh, the Gilboa Fossil Forest. And a variety of other plants. Um, for those of you familiar with the sort of work I do, you'll know that many of these plants are now defunct. A lot of the plants in this landscape should be joined together in different ways or pulled apart and turned into a different number of plants. Some of them are sort of biologically impossible. You can't grow this little tree into this little tree in any way that we understand these types of plants to grow. And there's, there's no interactions between plants. It's just a landscape that's been planted with a variety of different um, organisms. And uh, what I'd like to establish it really is the truth behind um, the Middle Devonian flora and how it, how it grew. The first forests have a lot of impact on the earth system and we particularly think of the origin of woody tissues. These are things with lots of carbon in them. They can be recalcitrant. They pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis. They can end up as biomass through bits of coal, charcoal, even complete coal beds, so they're very important. Um, and then we have the business of roots from fungal associations, silicate weathering, more carbon dioxide door down, perhaps eventually forming uh, marine carbonate, so processes that mo most of you probably understand. Um, this was to be the focus of my talk, really, but when I sat down and planned it, I decided it was far too boring, and I'd rather talk about things in a more general way. And also, Jenny... Um, Jenny Morris in Sheffield has written a very good summary, I should say, um, a sort of uh, a rewrite of the talk that David Beerling gave at the same uh, function last year. And so I sort of <coughs> refer you to Jenny's paper, which was just published recently in Paleontology, really, uh, for this part. And then we have the business of producing litter, plants producing litter, detritivores eating the litter, the beginnings of the terrestrial food chain. Well, some of you will be indignant by this point, say, ah, oh, yeah, Middle Devonian. It's, it's not that these things were invented by forests in the Middle Devonian. These are things that were going on anyway. But the growth of forests and of large plants industrialised these processes to the, to the point where they really, really did have a big impact on the way the Earth system worked. So this is typically expressed in these sort of diagrams of, this is an excellent summary of various people's work on carbon dioxide levels, all of which show that when they're modelled, they should be rapidly dropping. Um, carbon dioxide should be coming down through the Devonian, largely because people like me, so the big plants there, and then we put them in their models. So there's a circular argument involved in that, I guess. Um, the period of time we're talking about now, I, I think we should move the origin of forests from textbooks, typically in the, particularly the Fermenian, the last part of the Devonian, down into the Ifelian and Juvetian, which is the middle Devonian, and to the very beginning of the uh, Franian. So the transition to a forested planet from little plants to big things that we might call trees probably took about 10 to 12 million years during the middle Devonian. The places I'm going to be talking about today include uh, New York and the famous Gilboa fossil forest on the east coast of New York, and Germany and Belgium, 
uh, Spitsbergen, and then North and South China, or Northwest and South China, which are, this is sort of a rough approximation where Xinjiang was, and here is uh, Yunnan over there. And you'll notice that these environments take in the warm temperate zone, the arid zone, uh, and then up into the tropical zone as well. So there's a quite a good coverage of um, environments. And this is just a sample of what we know, but probably this is the most important of the localities. I'd like to start at the beginning of the um, time period that we're looking at. Um, I'm particularly proud of working with Peter Giessen, who's a German um, geotechnical engineer, but he's also a very, very competent um, paleontologist and responsible for a large number of very, very spectacular and important discoveries. And particularly at this site of Lindlar, it's a spectacular um, quarry, it's a working quarry, and uh, by coincidence, when we started working together, the um, excavations were just going through a lens, a single lens of very fossiliferous um, sandstone. <clears throat> Peter's incredibly uh, tough at collecting difficult specimens. And when I mean difficult specimens, we're looking at a scale bar here of one metre. So I, I haven't really established how much these specimens weigh, but they're enormous bits of rock. And the interesting thing is that they contain complete trees. It's very rare in the Devonian to find things which you can call complete trees. And these are small trees, I agree with you. They're, they're only two metres high or so. But at this locality, Peter was able to collect a large number of more or less complete trees of a plant called Calamophyton. And Calamophyton here, reconstructed on the left, is an amalgamation of some old um, taxa, which were previously described in previous collections from the Lindlar Quarry, which were made in the 1960s. Calamophyton represents a group of plants called the Pseudosprocnalian cladoxylopsis, which is a little bit of a mouthful, but um, you should increasingly become familiar with these very interesting plants. These are almost certainly the first tree-sized organisms that um, grew on the planet, or at least vascular plants that grew on the planet. You know, you're probably all trying to think of your favourite invertebrates and, and large Devonian fish at this point. But the great things about his collection is that you get a whole number of different sized specimens from tiny little ones to big ones. And the tiny little ones are nice and thin and the big ones are increasingly fat. And this tells you that these plants were not only growing upwards, but they were growing outwards. So there's secondary growth. There was growth after the initial um, growth from the apex of the plant, which is quite um, important to us. In short, because we're still doing this work, there's a couple of other very important plants at the same locality. There's this thing called uh, Waylandia, which was previously known, but we know now it's in a lot more detail. And again, these fossils are about a metre and a half in height. What's significant about this particular type of plant has its roots at the bottom, and then it grows up, and it has these branches which comes off, which may be leafy branches, in fact. And then at the top, it turns into a big... Uh, spike, like uh, a lot of the angiosperm uh, flowering plants that you're familiar with in roadsides and, and so on. So it, it's a plant which, in a way, knows where it's going. It's going to grow up, it's going to have lots of leaves, and then it's going to turn fertile, and then it's probably going to die. It's also probably a cladoxylopsid. And then finally, there's a very enigmatic plant at Linlo, which is our, probably our most difficult piece of work that we have to do, but which appears to run along the ground. It doesn't stand upright uh, for most of its length, and it has lots of uh, complicated digitate branches, and it probably is also a cladozolopsid plant. Okay, so this is the Linla landscape reconstruction. This is from uh, a book by uh, Schweitzer from 1990. And he reconstructed into this landscape the plants he thought were growing there at the time. And the great thing about Peter's uh, collections is that we now really know what these plants look like. And we also know their abundance, 
how they're crammed into little depressions on, in, and in fact on a shallow sea floor. And they've probably been dragged out from very shallow sandy islands, deposited into a shallow sea. Um, and so he worked with a, an artist in the Netherlands and was able to produce another reconstruction of this landscape, which is absolutely spectacular. It's made possible by uh, modern digital art and so on. But to me, this gives a much better impression of what vegetation was looking like in the Devonian. Just remember that these trees were probably only two to four meters in height. But in one way, it's a fantasy. It's an it's a imagination of lots of evidence of things which have been moved around. So it's not evidence of um, real ecology. It's an imagined ecology. Although I suspect it's, it's, really quite, um, it's really quite representative of the truth. It emphasizes that Lindlar was really a, a cladozoelopsid world. These cladozoelopsid plants were probably the most dominant things in the terrestrial environment. And um, they were quite diverse at that point. So as we come through time into the end of the Ifelian, then we have other plants which belong to the Cladozolopsis. I just emphasize that they have very particular types of branching. We call this digitate. It's like a hand on the end of a, a limb. There's no leafy organs here. They're just little stick-like appendages, which probably did the job that leaves do today. And then you have a trunk with branch scars or, or frond scars. And the fronds abscised from these scars and just fell onto the ground, producing a litter as this uh, tree grew up into the um, sky. The only fossil I know that competes with, um, uh, with Peters from Lindlar for spectacularness uh, is, is probably this uh, thing here. In terms of scale, then, this digitate branch here is exactly 66 centimetres long. So this is an enormous slab with the top of a tree. This was found in upstate New York by Frank uh, Manolini and uh, Linda Van Anla Hernick from the New York State Museum. And uh, it came with another slab below it, which had more of the trunk, and then a little bit more which uh, fell to pieces when they tried taking it out. They also found a trunk which is over six <coughs> metres long, and at the top of the trunk, you start to see the beginnings of the branch scars where the branches were attached to the tree. And so it's not too difficult to reconstruct a tree here, which is six to eight metres tall, just 40 centimetres across at the bottom, which by the early Franian, the very earliest part of the late Devonian, was forming very, very substantial trees in upstate New York. And again, this is a pseudosprotonalian cladozylopsid. So, after the burst of diversity of cladozylopsids that we see at Lindlar, then these pseudosprotonalians become the dominant form of cladozylopsid. And for some of that time, they're the dominant form of trees uh, on the planet. <coughs> How you recognize a cladozylopsid in real terms is that the trunk is made up of a discrete number of little plates of xylem or, or woody tissue. It's not a tree which grows as a cylinder and just gets bigger and bigger by growing from a cambium, this, this layer around the outside which divides to form wood on the inside and phloem on the outside and just gets bigger and bigger like the trees that you see out on the road outside. So it, it's very complicated. It has all these tiny little plates of xylem within it. And the pseudosprotonalians themselves are probably best recognized from the fact that they have these digitate or hand-shaped branches with uh, little stick-like leaf-like appendages attached to them. So this is a really exciting type of organism which has only been reconstructed in its full um, glory in the last uh, a few years. It's worth saying that at, at Lindlar and the, the site in Germany, uh, uh, in Belgium, I just showed you these two plants, and the maximum axis diameter is about uh, 20 centimetres. By the time we get to 
Watieza in the late Civetti and early Franian, then, as I told you, this thing is about 40 centimetres in diameter at the base. But many of you will know that, in fact, the bottoms of these tree stumps could get up to a metre. This is a specimen from the famous Gilboa fossil forest in upstate New York. And these things are just massive. I mean, they're, they're enormous lumps of sandstone. So we know that these things probably got a whole lot bigger than uh, six to eight metres tall. <coughs> so I want to take you to Gilboa, upstate New York, to explore the ecology of one of these uh, late Givetian cladezolopsid forests. This is the site as it looked in February 2010. You can see they're digging down into what was an old sandstone quarry where they'd extract sandstone blocks, stick them on the steam engine, and trundle them up to the dam, which is just a bit upstream, and, and used to build a dam in the 1920s. The dam, I should say, was falling apart and had to be reconstructed, and that gave us the opportunity to watch as they cleared out the old quarry and used the mixture of sandstone and mud that was in it to build road bases <coughs> around their sites. And this is what the quarry looked like after they'd cleared it out. In terms of cladoxylopsids, within this patch here, which was mapped by Bill Stein, um, they found 122 bases of cladoxylopsid trees and another 75 which looked like they really should be um, cladoxylopsid trees. When this site had been first excavated in the 1920s to form sandstone, they'd found these big tree stumps. And a very um, iconic exhibition was made in the New York State Museum at that time, showing the reconstruction of these trees as, as an organism called Eospermatopteris. And this was the iconic form of this forest. We'd been lucky enough that we could study this forest not only in Riverside Quarry, but also in the oldest site that was known, that's known from the 1860s, 1870s, and also from a Manor Hill Falls section. So this forest is not just a one-off event. It keeps reoccurring throughout the sedimentary history of the Schoharie Valley. So what happens at the base of these big trees? Well, we recognise that on the surface of these trees there are lots of roots coming out of the surface of the trees and they run down the surface of the, uh, the stump here and out into the surrounding sediment and uh, we were able to measure the angles and so on of these roots coming out. And this entire area around the, root, uh, the tree bases is just full of hundreds and hundreds of very thin, only two or three centimetres wide roots just going out in all directions, much like at the bottom of a uh, some palm trees. You can see here just the sheer quantity of roots which are coming out through this, the sides of these mounds. And um, when we published this paper, we were very lucky to work with uh, an artist called Victor Leshik, and he produced for us this illustration based on uh, our thoughts at the time, and in particular showing at the bottom of these cladozolopsid trees this big mass of roots coming out and going out into the surrounding environment. One of the specimens collected in the 1920s was this uh, big slab, which obviously came out from the bottom of the quarry. This is a 10 centimetre scale bar, so we're dealing with <coughs> large slabs now. Uh, when it was originally published, it looked like this. Um, clever lighting makes it inverted. This is, in fact, the bottom of a tree, and the tree is going into the wall away from us. So we're looking at the underneath of the slab here. It's been painted brown, which is not terribly helpful, put in the exhibition, and then in the 1970s smashed to bits with a sledgehammer and uh, dispersed around the museum. It's only through the persistence of my colleagues at New York State Museum that we're able to even find this much of it again. But it's been fantastic to be able to look at this chunk of the uh, quarry floor uh, in laboratory conditions. What we can see there is lots of roots. And I've chosen a bit where the roots are going out this way. So here are the roots coming out across this way. And here you can see, hopefully, um, something that looks like somebody's just driven a bicycle across there. But it's a very small bicycle 
So there's lots of little dots here. This is a herbaceous lycopod, and this axis of a herbaceous lycopod is going over some roots and under other roots. So it's actually tangled up in the rooting system here. And hence we have in the reconstruction this little herbaceous lycopod called Leclerchia um, peering in this forest and interacting with this uh, tree. But if you take these two bits of the slab and turn them over, so here's the is firm top to space, here are the roots coming out. Now we're looking on the upper surface. Here is a big rhizome of another plant. And this is going along the bottom of the quarry and bending and it's got little branches coming off and so on. Those branches, again, leafless. This is a plant called a, a neurophytalian progymnosperm. It has a woody rhizome. It's not a trunk because it's not going upwards, but it, it is a woody trunk which is expanding by growth of, of wood. This is what they look like in the quarries. Often they're going along perhaps just below the surface of the soil, but every so often they pop out of the ground. And in fact, they head towards some of the big trees and then disappear as if they're going up the trees. They often have lots of tufts of roots coming out of the side of them. And so in our reconstruction, we have them going along the bottom of the quarry and with the roots coming out and then occasionally going up up the trees. Undoubtedly some of these were actually underground for some of their length, but um, artistically it worked well to have them visible uh, above ground and um, also sort of aped in this nice detritivore that we've got uh, here which comes from the Blenheim Gil Gilboa uh, <coughs> insect larvae study. So Bill Stein was able to map the bottom of this quarry and come up with a, a really spectacular map showing the bases of all the Cladiosolopsids with all these aneurophytalian rhizomes um, going around between them. It's always good to show a cladogram. So here's a cladogram, knit from uh, Brigitte Meyer-Berto. Um, in terms of phylogeny, the aneurophytalians, as I've just shown you, are part of a group called the progymnosperms. This term progymnosperms, perhaps not so much in favour just at the moment because of the topology of this cladogram here, um, but I'd say that this cladogram is on very shaky ground in terms of its topology, so I'll still talk about progymnosperms as their actual group. They're plants with woody rhizomes, uh, or woody trunks, but which lack seeds. So they're uh, reproduce using spores. <coughs> the Aneurophytalians have this woody rhizome and small roots. And they don't have pollinated leaves. There's a second group called the Archaeopteridalians, which have a woody trunk, upright trunk, large roots and leafy fronds. And we'll come to those in just a minute. Over here we have the Cladoxylopsids, which have this very strange anatomy with uh, radiating plates, which are probably woody. And over here, completely unrelated to the, all of the above, are the lycopods, or the lycopsids, which have uh, tiny little leaves with a single vein, and again, uh, usually small roots. So I'm going to look at this group just now, the lycopsids. Because in Gilboa, we did put one in the middle of the reconstruction, because they do occur at Gilboa. Here's a very nice specimen, which is in the Gilboa Museum, which is worth a visit if you happen to be in upstate New York. And we found some of these organisms um, preserved, flattened on the bottom of the Gilboa quarry, but unfortunately we're not unable to connect them into the ground and into the map um, particularly. So they're there, but we don't know their role in the ecosystem. So um, I'd like to show you something about the ecology of lycopsids, and we're going now to the Paleo Equator. We're going to uh, Moonindal in... Uh, Svalbard, this is John Marshall, as you probably know, and here's some upright lycopod trees in uh, this valley. Um, if you ever get bored of drawing location maps, then get the Daily Mail to do it for you. It's uh, <laughs> always a uh, delight to have them interested. So here we are, right in the middle. The lycopsid trees are quite small, 
about 10 centimeters in diameter. The base is getting up to more like about 20 centimeters. Here's a base in situ. And we have uh, the trunk apex here, some leafy branches um, of this organism called Protolepidendron dropsis. The delightful thing about these particular localities is that there are many trees upright in uh, various areas of the valley. And uh, it's very easy to reconstruct their ecology. There's only one sort of tree. They grow very close together. Um, and, and there they are. So um, it's not a massively interesting deposit, really, in that... There's only a limited amount that you can say about it, but it seemed to uh, go down well, so that's good. Slightly more interesting is the fact that as we were leaving this site for the last time, we spotted a couple more trees here. As you can see, the lycopods are always represented by sandstone casts. They've rotted away and been ill-filled with sandstone. Whereas this type of tree here is made up of, of coal. It's compressed wood. And so this rang a bell that there should be something different about this, and particularly as there's big roots coming out of the bottom of these little trees. So as we were leaving, we took some of the um, wood away with us. And when we looked at the wood under the SCM, then we discovered it had a very characteristic series of pits running in lines across the xylem. And this means that it comes from a tree called Archaeopteris, the Archaeopteridalian Progymnosperms. In Spitsbergen, this plant is called Svalbardia. It's famous because it's supposed to be an Archaeopteridalian progymnosperm with very, very flimsy little narrow leaves. And that's, that's what it seems to look like. And it would appear that we can reconstruct these branches onto these trunks in one way or another. We don't really know about as much about it as we should do, and John and I are hoping to go back to uh, Svalbard this summer and uh, work on this plant instead of the other one. But it's obvious that there are horizons where this plant is growing in situ and upright. More spectacularly, if we go back to New York State, we can see big rooting systems of this type of plant. Um, again, discovered by people at the New York State Museum. This is a mid in age. The Spitsbergen material was all very early Franian in age. And this is a plant that's making a real impact on its environment. These are big rooting systems which are going out um, and exploring. Unlike the Cladozolopsids, the Aenurophytalian progymnosperms, and the lycopods, which all at this time just had very small uh, roots, just linear uh, one, two, or three centimetre roots going out and uh, not considerable distances. What was curious about the quarry at Cairo, New York, and this is what Jenny has written about a bit and uh, Dave Beerling would have talked about last year, is that not only do we find Archaeopteris there, but we also find our friends, the, Eosperma, uh, the, uh, the large cladozylopsid bases that we saw at Gilboa. They're also in the same environment. This is interesting because up till now it's been considered that the Gilboa trees were growing in a swamp, Archaeopteris grows in dry soils. The lycopods we found in um, Svalbard almost certainly were living in wet soils. Yet here in red soils, which presumably means dry, we find both the Cladozolopsids and the Archaeopteridalians. So we have a forest that's the same age as the one in Gilboa, more or less but the composition of the ecology of the forest is completely different. So it suggests that even just within the Catskill Mountains, there was a diversity of forest types during the Middle Devonian. Oopsie daisy. Oh, my map's gone. That's amazing. OK, never mind. There was uh, just a little bit of Bill's map here. You can imagine it, it's sort of that there, but showing the rooting systems and the presence of these cladozylopsids in the same um, environment. It's amazing. I can't explain that one. Okay, so just a little bit more about Archaeopteris. Archaeopteris, by the time we get to New York State, 
has more substantial leaves. These leaves are sort of zipping themselves up. They're getting more planated, they're getting flatter, they're getting greener. Uh, the fronds are getting woodier. There's lots of wood in these fronds. And we also have trunks. Trunks, again, which have groups of pits in layers across the xylem. And many fossils now which seem to show that this is more or less the trunk and that the fronds are attached directly on the sides of the trunk. Here we can see a pyrotized trunk, which is just wood. This is this big expanding cylinder of wood, which is forming the, uh, the trunk. So, as almost a summary, because there's one little bit more to come, um, we have a variety of forests here. Two forests in Svalbard, Archaeopteris and Lycopods. Gilboa, we have a mix, um, Cladozolopsid and Europhyte forest. At Cairo, we have a uh, Cladozolopsid Archaeopteridalian forest. And then we go back into the Eiffelian, we have the uh, Cladozolopsid world of Linlar. So we're getting a really good feeling for the evolution of these forest ecosystems, even if the, um, the, the record is quite patchy. I just want to show you three slides to show a, a Chinese perspective. In South China, we don't have progymnus ferns, a really important group that's completely missing. Um, there are probable tree-sized cladozolopsids there, but they're not of the pseudosprocmalian type. They more represent some of the other oddball ones that we found in that diverse Lindlar assemblage, which is quite interesting. There are big tree lycopods. Uh, perhaps they have cormose bases, such as this one, which I'm not even sure I can pronounce. But there are also lycopods which don't have lots of little roots coming out of them. They actually have a big downwards branching uh, rooting system, which is completely unusual for this age, and it doesn't have little rootlets coming off it. So it's a completely unique lycopod uh, rooting system here, which is maybe something to do with an ancestral iso isoitalian form. If we go across to Xinjiang now, no, no, northwest China, and you remember that that is up in the tropics, uh, in, floating around somewhere between South China and Euro America. Um, we find lycopods, for example, which probably have uh, bases with lots and lots of little rootlets coming out of them, just, uh, just as in Spitsbergen. And we find a Europhytalian progymnosperms, but we don't find pseudosprocmalian cladosopsis, we don't find Archaeopteris. So forest composition, although there's vaguely the same thing going on in China, it's actually quite different, um, and we don't have a good handle on, on what's going on in Chinese forests at the moment. One way of dealing with this problem is by using micropaleontology, working with John Marshall, looking at spores. Here's a megaspore and microspores, which are coming out of the Spitsbergen lycopod forests. And they coincide very much in the sections with the bases of the fossil trees where we find them. So we're pretty confident that we can identify the spores of these plants. And we can also identify the same spores out here in Xinjiang, working with uh, Hong He and his colleagues out in China. You can see the same megaspores and microspores there. <coughs> And in fact, if you go into the literature, as John can do, he's a cyclopedic knowledge of the micropaleontological literature, and he can trace these uh, spores as they travel around the planet. Because not only are they more abundant, but they are more stratigraphically constrained as well. So you can see their inceptions, and you can follow the growth of lycopod trees across the equatorial forests. Um, and outwards. And in fact, you can see it in enough detail, see, see another sort of tribe of them going along the north uh, coast of Gondwana. So micropaleontology, palynology seems to be a good route into uh, fleshing out the detail of the afforestation of the planet at this time. So in terms of a summary then, exceptional specimens allow us now to reconstruct the first trees in extraordinary detail and in accurate detail. The very rare fossil forests allow us to explore with some degree of accuracy the ecology of these fossil forests. Although we have geographic coverage which is limited in the macrofossil and particularly the forest record, 
Um, the microfossil record allows us accurate and time calibrated inceptions and migration patterns of these plants to be established. Um, but that's all very Euro-America centric. Uh, China is undoubtedly going to be a very rich source of non-Euro-American data to feed into our um, databases. And ultimately, the aim of this research is not just to document this diversity, but by working with people like Jenny Morris and uh, the Sheffield uh, people, to uh, create credible models of vegetation, rooting systems, and their interactions with the lithosphere and, and so on, and inform future understanding and models of the entire Earth system during this time, which, as you know, is a time of tremendous change, including particularly carbon dioxide and uh, climate modelling. So I'd just like to thank all the people I've worked with over the last uh, years at the New York State Museum, my friends in Nanjing, Sheffield University, in New York State, including the uh, very nice policeman from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, who allowed us to work in uh, Gilboa Reservoir, um, in Liège, uh, in Oslo and Stockholm, working on the uh, uh, Arctic forest. And most particularly here in Cardiff, uh, Lindsay and Diane have really been um, a big influence in my life. Thank you.